Good morning, everybody. My name is Kevin Renaud. I'm with Peerless. Uh, we're going to get started here in just uh, just a few seconds. We're just going to wait for some people that are still trying to get in. Uh, again, thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you real soon. Good morning, thanks again. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Renaud with Peerless. Uh, most of the folks here are already in. There's still some people coming in, but in the spirit of uh, punctuality, we're gonna get started. Uh, some of you joined us last week, uh, welcome back. We had VELS 101. Uh, this week, we have another great group assembled. Uh, we have people from New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Texas, Georgia, uh, and if you look at the, uh, Purple star, there's also a country represented there and you'll find a chat box. And for the first three people that know what country that is and chat it in, we'll send out a peerless hat to. So if you know what that country is, of course, peerless folks are excluded as is the, the folks that live in that country. So, but thanks for joining us. Uh, also, we have Rio Temp joining us from California. Uh, the industry is represented across again, a, a great many industries, OEM skid builders, we have chemical, uh, facilities, water uh, treatment, education, government, contractor, and manufacturing. Uh, as far as Peerless goes, again, we've been around uh, a little over 100 years, but we've certainly uh, evolved into a dynamic and trusted source for process components uh, with a goal to keep plants operating efficiently and projects running smoothly and on time. We do have a, a diverse and skilled Customer base, it's highly complex, and we're certainly proud to play a role uh, in their challenges. So uh, Peerless itself is broken into three main divisions. We have the Procore segment, which focuses on the OEMs, uh, capital expense projects. Um, we have the process group, again, which is more of the MRO, chemical, pharmaceutical, manufacturing. Uh, and finally, our high temp fabrication division, which uh, we do some insulation refractory, uh, scientific surfaces, and laboratory and medical. Uh, we do machine to print with CNC equipment in our facility. As far as the players here in today's uh, webinar, Nate O'Connor is with us from Rio Temp. Uh, he's the business development manager for electrical. Uh, he will be doing the uh, brunt of the, the presentation here. Uh, Justin Kloss as well, he's our regional sales manager. He's also out of San Diego, spends a lot of time here on the East Coast. Um, as far as the peerless side of things, Dan Morgan, who you'll hear from in a minute, is our continuous improvement manager in quality. Uh, he's going to be our moderator for today's presentation. Uh, Greg Barrow is our business development uh, guru here on the process side of things. He leads our process group. Um, Austin Smith is one of our application engineers, and uh, it was Austin who wrote a, a blog for our website recently. Uh, concerning RTDs and thermocouples, and it was it was pretty well received. So uh, we decided to move forward with this. So again, I'm Kevin Renaud, uh, Business Development. And um, with that, we are going to turn it over to Dan Morgan, who's going to just give you a little bit of the basics of the of the show here today. Dan? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, like Kevin mentioned, I will be uh, keeping an eye on things here uh, as we work through the presentation. Um, you'll see there's there's an area here in the control panel uh, within the webinar interface. Um, 
to allow you guys to, to ask questions uh, or send chats. So um, if at any point during the presentation uh, you'd like some more clarity on anything, um, definitely feel free to, to send in a question through there and I will you know, either answer the question directly um, or more likely um, I'll, I'll toss that question over to Nate uh, or Justin um, and interject within the presentation and they'll be able to answer it for the, uh, for the whole group. So um, questions are, are highly encouraged, of course. Um, there's also a chat function uh, you can use as well. So um, I'll be monitoring both. Um, so yeah, let them go. Um, so I guess at that point, uh, I'll turn this over to Nate. Sounds good. Thanks, Dan. All right. So, can everybody see my screen? Yes, but it is. Uh, it's in just. It's not in the present mode at the current time. Let me switch that over. There you okay. Go. All right. Um, well, first off, thank you to Peerless, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, present a little bit about thermocouples and RTEs today. Uh, thanks to all the attendees, too. Appreciate your time. <clears throat> so just to give you a quick background, Rio Temp has been around for over 50 years. We're a manufacturer of temperature and pressure instrumentation. Um, so we do have pressure gauges, diaphragm seals, uh, bimo thermometers, and also uh, thermocouples and RTDs and some related accessories. And so what we want to focus on today, we're going to talk about thermocouples and RTDs. Uh, we'll talk about the, you know, how does a thermocouple work? How does an RTD work? Um, we'll also go over why you would choose one flavor over another. Um, and then we'll also uh, go over a couple of tools as well, on product configurator, a new catalog that we have out, and some other uh, things like 3D drawings. So with that, um, I'll get started. And just again, to kind of echo uh, what Dan mentioned, if you do have questions, feel free to ask them. It's always nice to get a little feedback from the audience and you know see what kind of issues you guys are dealing with. And um, if you have specific questions that you want answered, uh, feel free to, to jump in and, and send those via text uh, over to Dan and he can ask me a question and we'll uh, try to get that answer for you. So, um, <clears throat> all right, so thermocouples and RTDs, just uh, to kind of give a quick overview, the most common way you're gonna see a thermocouple or an RTD is going to be in a head assembly, um, you know, in your facilities, on your your skids. Oftentimes, you're going to see that head assembly. It's very common. Uh, we also have remote mount where the head can be in one place, the stem could be over in the process, far away from that. And then we also have stem assemblies here, which you can get in compression fittings with mini mount plugs, all different uh, variety of, of ways to do that. Weld pads, those are going to be welded on the exterior of a pipe. So the pad actually gets welded on the outside. That's if you don't want to penetrate into the pipe. Oftentimes with like a steam application, that's going to be uh, the preferred way to, to get your temperature. We do have a compact temperature transmitter. So this is our slim line where it's got a nice small profile. Um, let me see if I can minimize this screen a little bit. Pull this down. Uh, protection tubes, these are used in very high temperature applications. These could be ceramic uh, or metal, or they're um, you know, used in very high temperatures. And then we have a variety of handheld probes. This one has a magnet on it. It's used for spot checking. Uh, we even make custom assemblies for rail cars where this could be an eight foot long stem that goes into a ra uh, rail car, could be a large vessel, stuff like that. So um, Rio Temp makes all the standard stuff, but we also specialize in doing a lot of custom work too. So if you do have a custom application, we can certainly help out with that and, and get that together for you. Okay, so uh, how does a thermocouple work? Just at a very basic level, you know, what is it? Um, a thermocouple is a pretty simple device. It consists of two different, two dissimilar metals. So you've got one metal on one leg, you've got a second metal on the other leg, two different wires come down and they're gonna be welded together. Uh, when you do that, you create what's called the hot junction. So this is where you're actually going to read your temperatures, where those two wires are uh, welded together. And then um, when heat is applied to that hot junction, it's going to create a predictable voltage. So you're going to 
going to get a little bit of a millivolt reading that's going to come up these wires. And um, because it's predictable, if you've got X millivolts, that's going to equal Y temperature. It's really that simple. Uh, two different wires, two different metals welded together, create your junction, apply heat, get a predictable voltage. Now that voltage is going to be read by either a temperature transmitter that's inside of the head, um, or this could just run all the way back into your control system, you know, your DCS, your uh, data logger, whatever you're, you're hooking up that, that thermocouple to. That's where you're going to get that uh, interpretation of that millivolt reading. Okay, so um, not a not a real complicated product when you kind of get underneath the hood and take a look at it. There are different types of thermocouples. So I mentioned two different metals. A type K thermocouple is going to have chromel and alumel as the two different metals. Um, a type K thermocouple is going to have iron and constantin. So you know there's different different metals that are used to create that thermocouple. Um, and then those are just referred to as a, a type J or a type K. That's what you're gonna you know, hear in the field is any type K thermocouple. Well, underneath the hood, that's kind of you know, the two different metals that are actually used to make that thermocouple. Uh, do we have any questions on the, the basics there? Just kind of the, the top um. one. Nothing yet. I guess something I'm maybe curious about, and you might be getting this into a, a, a later slide, is is there a way to to tell um, just by looking at the thermocouple uh, what what type um, you're using? Yes, and that that's a perfect segue. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> that was, that was right. a great segue to the next slide. Um, yeah, so it's a very good question. You know, how do you know if it's a type K? How do you know if it's a type J um, or a T or an E or an N? Uh, there are color codes, so the two legs of your thermocouple are going to have different colored insulation. So a type K is it's always going to have a yellow on one leg and then a red on the other. Um, this is throughout the U.S. These are our standard codes. So every manufacturer is going to use um, the same colors. Uh, and then you know, J is going to have red and white. So uh, that's a great way to figure out, you know, what do I have? If you open up a head assembly, you take a look at those wires, then you can instantly figure out you know, what, what thermocouple do I have. Uh, the extension wire, so you know, this is just a, a cheaper grade of wire. Um, so it's, it's not as pure, but it's, it's cheaper. And so it's used for extensions. So if you're gonna run you know, 100 feet of wire back to your ECS, um, oftentimes extension wire is what's gonna be used to do that. So you'll see it's got the same um, actual lead color for the insulation, but then the outer jacket is a different color. So that's the difference between those two. Um, in terms of choosing, you know, what type of th uh, thermocouple is a good choice for your process? So really, you know, the first question you're going to ask yourself is, you know, what is the operating, or what, you know, what's my process temperature? And each type of thermocouple is going to have a different temperature range. So like type K is going to go you know, all the way up to 2300, uh, whereas a J is going to have a much lower temperature range. So at a very first cut, if you're, you've got a process that's running at 1500 Fahrenheit, type J would definitely not be a good choice. Um, type K is, is certainly the way that you want to go for that particular option. Uh, if you're you know, running below that at maybe 1200, and you've got a choice between the two. Um, the next thing you can look at is accuracy. So when you look at type K's and J's, which are some of the most common styles out there, um, there really isn't a lot of accuracy difference between the two. And that's why you will see a little bit of both out in the field. Um, there are exotic uh, noble metal thermocouples. So those are going to have uh, a platinum inside wire, very expensive, but they are going to give you uh, a higher accuracy. So those are typically only used when you really get into high temperatures and you don't have a choice. You, you have to kind of, you know, pay to get that, that temperature and it's a, a much more expensive thermal. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, so not everybody is, a, is aware of this, um, with those 
any type of thermocouple, you've got two metals inside of there. And then the purity of that metal is going to dictate how accurate that thermocouple is. So your standard type K thermocouple, um, you know, depending on the temperature, you're going to have kind of your standard accuracy. And then if you, you have a process of say that you actually need a higher accuracy for your, your thermocouple, your type K, the quickest way to get a higher accuracy out of that thermocouple is to switch over to what's called special limits of error. So special limits of error is it's still the same two metals, but it's a higher purity. So when the actual wire manufacturer, you know, they'll run thousands and thousands of feet of, of type K uh, wire, they're going to take a section, maybe 500 feet of it, cut it, and then they're going to test it to see how pure it is. And if it's a standard purity, it goes into one box, you know, one bin. If it's a very high purity, then it's going to go into the special limits of error. And so just by getting a more pure metal, you're going to uh, just about double the accuracy of that thermocouple. So it's a um, good thing to keep in mind. Oftentimes, standard accuracy is enough for people. Um, but if you do have that application where you need it, that's uh, a good way to do it. Nate, uh, we do have a couple questions here now. Um, sure. The first one here, uh, can wires be mechanically joined to form a quote-unquote test hot junction? Um, do you need more yeah, clarity on like that, can, or is that enough? It's for, I, think the, I think what they're asking is, um, you know, like, can you just take some, some type K wire and, you know, weld it together on your own to create kind of a, a quick and dirty thermocouple is that uh, I believe you know, so I'll, and, I'll uh, yeah. maybe wait for a response through there but yeah if you can elaborate yeah, so on I that think, maybe. sure so that that is certainly possible um, yes uh, you can do that uh, it's going to be an exposed thermocouple so you're not going to have any protection from the stem sheath to keep moisture away from that thermocouple um, you know to keep uh, any kind of gases or the process from from getting onto it so if you wanted to, to do that on a bench to, you know, get a kind of a ballpark, uh, yes, that's, you know, it would technically create one, but you wouldn't want to put something like that, you know, into a process. You're going to get um, a lot of degradation from those metals very quickly. Okay. Uh, just follow up to that. Would it work uh, as well, or could it work theoretically if you were to just twist the weathers together as opposed to welding them? Uh, no, I, I mean, it's, it's not a good way to do it. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be a recommended method. You really want to weld those together to get a uh, good solid connection. If those were to come apart or you know, vibrate and maybe not make a good solid contact, they'll probably make multiple contacts within that twist too. So it's, yeah, that it would not be a, a good way to do it. Okay, um, and there's actually one more. Uh, is it possible to get two sets of connectors uh, within the same assembly? Yes. Um, so you can have a, a dual thermocouple where you would have two, uh, you know, two sets of, let's say, a type K. So you've got two type K thermocouples coming down the stem. And then um, oftentimes we're just going to, you know, weld all four of those wires together and you'll get two different thermocouple uh, readings. So you've got a kind of your backup set. But yes, you can. You can put two of them into the same stem. It's a good question. Okay. Yeah, that's that's good. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate the questions. That's, um, that's great. Thank you, everyone. And then, um, so as far as the stem types, there's kind of your two most standard options um, you probably heard of ungrounded and grounded so as far as you know what is ungrounded <clears throat> you've got those two wires that we you know welded together to create that thermocouple and then inside of the sheath there's a what's called a mineral insulation or like that's what i call it, mi cable mineral insulation and so it's a white powder that's really um, very densely packed around these wires around the outside edge to keep the wires from touching each other and also to keep them from touching the, the sheath on the outside. And so with an ungrounded stem, that insulation is going to, uh, that's going to be between the thermocouple junction, the hot junction there 
and the tip of the probe. And so it's going to have a little bit of insulation to create a barrier. And um, that's the most common thing that you'd see in the field. It's kind of the, the standard way to do it. Uh, the benefit of doing this is it's going to have less interference. So if you've got, um, you know, motor out there, other electrical noise in the area, um, just by having a little bit of insulation between those two, so they're not making contact, um, it's better in terms of uh, holding up to that interference. Uh, the other option is to have a grounded thermocouple. So a grounded thermocouple, you're going to weld the two wires together, but then those wires are also going to be welded to this outer metal sheath. So you've got one ball of metal right down there uh, at the tip. And the benefit of a grounded thermocouple is that you're going to get a faster response time. So when that process comes up um, and, and hits that sheath, it's going to go directly to the thermocouple, get you a quicker reading. It's about um, a little over twice as fast uh, response time you've got a, a grounded thermocouple. <clears throat> so again, you know, if you don't need a real quick response, then just go with your ungrounded. Um, but if it is a, a situation where you, you want the fastest possible response time, you do want to choose a grounded thermocouple. Um, <clears throat> the exposed version, so this kind of goes back to the question earlier. Um, you know, this, you can do this, but it's not recommended. Like you're, you're not protecting those wires um, from any kind of corrosion, um, moisture, they're they're really not going to hold up well if you just have your wires without any kind of protection around them. So uh, only if you needed just an extremely fast response time, but you you weren't concerned about that you know, that, that sensor failing um, pretty quickly. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? On, uh, uh, yeah, we actually did just uh, sure. so maybe just some clarity. Um, the electrical interference is is more significant with the grounded thermal well, uh, th thermal couple, correct? Grounded, yes, yep, and that's because it it is making electrical contact with the sheath, and the sheath is probably touching a thermal, and the thermal well, uh, you know, is touching the pipe, and so you're just it's got a more direct <coughs> connection to um, the environment around it. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, just to kind of recap the pros and cons of a thermocouple, um, the biggest reason that a thermocouple is going to be used is because it's got a much higher temperature range. So if you're running at um, you know, 1500 or, or 1800 or 1200, you've got to use a thermocouple. You can't use an RTD because it's, it's too high of a temperature for an RTD. So um, you know, that's why you'll, you'll oftentimes see a thermocouple used in a high temperature application. Um, with the grounded tip, you will get a faster response time, so that's another potential benefit. Um, the cost is really not that that much of a difference between R to D or thermocouple, so I wouldn't. That's it's pretty minor, um, you know, maybe like five percent less, eight percent something like that, but not not a lot. Um, and they are able to hold up to um, vibration a little better, uh, although we do have some some tricks up our sleeve in terms of making uh, R T Ds very red. Uh, vibration resistant too. So then the cons, um, they are less accurate. So they're they're a lot less accurate than an RTD. Um, you know, you're looking at in Fahrenheit, you know, plus or minus four to five degrees um, versus an RTD, which is going to be a, a whole lot more accurate, and we'll get into that later. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks. Uh, it can have some interference, and the lead wires do need to be the same metal. So if you're your thermocouple is coming up and going directly into a transmitter, then you're converting it to 4 to 20, you're good. But if you want to run lead wires all the way back to your control system, you do have to have the same uh, material for those lead wires as your thermocouple. So if you're, you have to have a type K extension wire, or type J or type T or N, whatever you've got. Um, one, one other kind of uh, pretty important thing to keep in mind um, for the viewers out there too is thermocouples are going to naturally degrade over time so that metal is it is going to um, degrade over time it's going to uh, break down a little bit and that it doesn't matter you know if you, you get them from us or from somebody else they're all just naturally inherently going to uh, drift lower over time so you will see you know depending on how high your temperature is or your process is uh, that drift could you know can be up to 10 degrees uh, fahrenheit per year going down so for example, if you've got a, a you know process running at 1500, 
um, when you first stick in that thermocouple, you'll be you know, pretty close to that 1500. Then a year later, it might be reading 1490, but uh, it's actually still running at 1500. It just, it's starting to drift down. So you're gonna start wasting energy by trying to bring your process up another 10 degrees or you know, two years later, it could be you know, 15 degrees where you're just kind of wasting energy to, to get that thermocouple up. And so that's oftentimes where you'll see scheduled maintenance to swap these out. Um, and then Dan, I think we have a question. Like a we've got a question. few. Yeah. Um, well, oh, actually we've got some think our questions. questions from, from the, yeah. Right. Right. Um, so I'll try to go through these one at a time. Um, the first one is where should the cold junction point be located? So maybe just a little more clarity on what the, uh, maybe probe like termination options are at the other end. Sure. Yeah. Um, we don't have a great photo of it. Um, probably should have included one of those two, but so you've got your thermocouple down here and you've got your wires going up the stem and then inside of this head you can either have a terminal block where you connect the one, those two wires onto one side of the terminal block and then your incoming wires are going to connect to the other side of that terminal block so that's kind of one option um hey dan can you uh mute on your end i'm getting a little feedback from the Thank you. Um, and then the other option is for the cold junction, if you've got a four to 20 transmitter inside of the head. So you've got your thermocouple wires coming up and then those are gonna terminate directly onto your um, your transmitter. So you have a hockey puck four to 20 transmitter in there and then that's gonna, you hook up your, your incoming uh, wires to your four to 20 transmitter and, and you're good to go. So that's kind of the cold end of it. Your hot end and then your cold end is either going to be a terminal block or transmitter inside of that head to either convert that to 4 to 20 or to just extend those wires back out. Okay. Um, okay. Is there another um, yeah, there's, <laughs> they're coming in fast here. So okay, um, good. Yeah. the next question is, do, do higher temperatures create a greater drift over time? They do. Yep. So a higher temperature will create more drift. Yes. There's not an exact rule of thumb or like a specific equation to figure that out, but um, each one's going to be a little different. But it is, it does get worse the higher your temperature is. Okay. Um, and along <laughs> the same lines as that, um, is the thermocouple extension wire also a source of temperature drift? Yes, yes meaning so maybe like will... the longer the <laughs> extension wire is, the, the more drift, perhaps? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the more inaccuracy, you get a little more inaccuracy, the, the longer your extension wires are. Um, and then they will degrade in the same way a thermocouple will grade, degrade, but it won't be um, it won't be as nearly as bad because um, kind of related to that earlier question, it's not going to be at a real high temperature. So it's just going to be at uh, like an ambient temperature, but you will still get some degradation of the, the lead wire, extension wire. Okay, um, and lastly, um, yes, if the entire measuring system is properly grounded, um, will that help to eliminate uh, some of the noise that you see? Yeah, yeah, it will. Um, yep, so that that's definitely um, a good practice and it, it will help. Um, and it's you know, it's not to say that you're, you're necessarily gonna get like a whole lot of interference, um, but you know, it just kind of depends on your, your application, but yeah, proper grounding, is certainly going to help. Okay. Um, so right. I guess maybe we're going to try something. Uh, try something here real quick, uh, based on some of the stuff we just learned here from Nate. Uh, we're going to launch a poll here in a second, just to test uh, some of the things that we just learned in the last couple of slides. So uh, you should see a question pop up on the screen, and um, you know, hopefully it's easy enough to answer. And we'll we'll run this poll for for a minute and. See what kind of responses we get. Should I? Um, I'll keep going then. Um, I'll keep going there. The poll actually does okay, take up the screen uh, for the viewer, so um, oh, okay. we'll just uh, collect yeah. some responses here and um, give it another twenty seconds or so.
All right, looks like we've got a good number of votes here. So I will uh, go ahead and close the poll and see how we did. Okay, perfect. So yeah, it looks like 91% uh, of uh, the participants in the poll were correct um, in thinking the grounded thermocouple has the faster response time. So okay. nice work. Perfect. Nice, good job, guys. That's awesome. Um, thank you, Dan. So uh, I'm going to shift over to an RTD now. So an RTD is a resistance temperature detector. <clears throat> so it's a very small chip, uh, basically that is at the end of uh, the two different lead wires that are going to come off it. Um, actually, you can have more than two, which we'll get into in a second. But it's a small chip, and there's going to be a very thin layer of platinum that's laid down onto this chip and then it's um, kind of sandwiched in between uh, some ceramic and glass layers and uh, epoxied all together. <clears throat> so that's your RTD, a little bit of uh, platinum, which is uh, can give you a very predictable voltage again. So as you heat this up, the, uh, I'm sorry, not voltage, uh, resistance, sorry. Um, so as you heat this up, you're gonna get that predictable resistance uh, or ohms and x number of ohms is going to give you a y temperature so again it's a it's a very simple device kind of like your thermocouple there's not a lot to it when you you kind of look underneath the hood and again similar to the thermocouple it's the in this case the resistance needs to be interpreted so that's going to be either interpreted by your 4 to 20 transmitter that could be inside of the head or if this is going back into your control system directly, um, then your, your control system itself is gonna be what is going to interpret that, uh, <clears throat> that resistance value and tell you what the temperature is. Uh, we use a thin film RTD. Uh, thin film is a little more resistant to vibration uh, versus a, a wire wound RTD, which some other manufacturers use. Uh, we, we use exclusively thin film unless someone specifically requests it. Uh, in order to get just better vibration resistance. Um, do you have any questions on the first part of this? Um, none so far. Okay, perfect. All right, so then um, <clears throat> for the RT itself, you've got, uh, you, you know, you only have two legs coming off of that chip, so you have the two legs, but in terms of the number of wires that are gonna come off of an RTD, you only technically need two wires to power the RTD and get your resistance value, um, but that's not a recommended way to uh, to get your reading. And the reason for that is the the actual wire itself. So if you've got a, a six inch stem, you've got six inches of, of wire coming up. Uh, if you've got a 12 inch stem, you get 12 inches of wire. That wire is going to add a little bit of resistance, and it's going to cause inaccuracy in terms of uh, you know, getting a good re resistance value reading. You don't want to be reading the wire resistance along with the RCD. You just want the RCD by itself. And so what you'll see a very common setup is going to be a three wire RCD. That's the, you know, kind of the, the standard way to do it. Uh, three wire is going to have, you know, one wire, your white wire on one side, and then you're going to have two reds on the other. So that redundant red wire that's gonna be used to figure out how much resistance this wire is actually creating and then pull that out of the equation and subtract that out. So by doing that, then you're left with only the resistance of just that RTD um, by itself. Uh, so if you're specifying an RTD, uh, you're selecting one, three wire is, is your, your best choice. Just you know, kind of use that as your standard. Uh, if you really need higher accuracy, you can use a four wire RTD. So this is gonna create what's called a, a true bridge, and it's gonna power the RTD um, with uh, two of the legs, uh, number one and four, and then two and three are gonna give you your actual reading uh, of the resistance. So it works in a, a similar way, but it actually, by powering it, it, it gives, kind of takes into account any additional uh, resistance that you might get from like a terminal block, uh, screws on a terminal block, just little additional resistance. <clears throat> and then uh, you you probably have seen 100 ohm versus 1,000 ohm. So, you know, what does that mean? Well, 
a uh, 100 ohm RTD is going to give you 100 ohms of resistance at zero degrees Celsius. Okay. And then a 1,000 ohm RTD is going to give you 1,000 ohms of resistance at zero degrees C. So that's kind of your starting point. Um, and then from there, the resistance is going to go up. So if you've got, like, you'll, oftentimes you'll see a, a 385 curve. So that 385 means that for every one degree Celsius above zero, it's going to add 0.385 ohms uh, to that. So you've got 100 as your starting point, then you add you know, 0.385 going up uh, every one degree C from there to give you um, <clears throat> the amount of resistance. It does give you more resolution with a thousand ohm. Um, so you know, in certain applications, that it makes more sense. But let's say 95% of the time. Uh, you're going to have a 100 ohm RTD, and that's going to be, you know, give you good solid accuracy, uh, very accurate unit, and, and uh, work for your most applications. Any questions on? Yes, uh, one question. So <laughs> the platinum uh, element is is what's seen most commonly. Are there are there other material options for that, and and why would would one would a different material um, potentially be chosen over over platinum? Mm -hmm. Um, so there are some other ones. Um, they're kind of uh, older, kind of legacy, like copper and nickel um, type of RTDs. They're not, you know, I'd say 90, 99% of everything is going to be platinum. Um, now, like, say, currently in the industrial world. Um, the other ones are, are very rare. It, you know, they're usually older, um, really older applications is where you'll see it. But Platinum is going to give you a higher accuracy. Um, it's, it's a better metal to use for your RGD. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so just to recap again, you know, pros and cons of an RGD, it is much higher accuracy. So um, your temperature range is limited to 1100 Fahrenheit, but if you're if your process is running at say 800 Fahrenheit or 500 or 300 or 1000, um, and, and an RTD is going to give you, you know, plus or minus 0.3 degrees C or you know, less than one degree Fahrenheit accuracy versus four to five degrees of a thermocouple. So it's it's way more accurate uh, if you're falling within this temperature range. Uh, it's also more stable, more repeatable. Um, it's just a more accurate. Uh, sensor, it's not going to drift in the same way that a thermocouple will. So if you do have a, you know, a, a process less than a thousand degrees or you know, less than eleven hundred, um, it's a, a really good option to look at to get better accuracy, more stability, and um, it's, it's got a lot of benefits in terms of accuracy. Uh, it's, it is more immune to electrical noise. Um, you can't have a grounded RTD because of that little chip. You can't weld that chip to the metal. You destroy it um, so you know it's a slower but you know again most of the time unless you need a really fast response that's not going to be an issue so keep keep RTDs in mind depending on where your process temperature is uh, any questions before I go on yeah. good to go yep okay all right so uh, going back to RTDs just Quickly, I, I'll try to speed through some of this um, so we can show you the configurator. But uh, you know, why do thermocouples fail? They do, uh, you're going to get metal fatigue, wear and tear, uh, the drift that we talked about, corrosion, humidity, broken wires. If you have grounding where metal is touching some of the wires, uh, all those things are, are certainly going to cause issues um, on the thermocouple side of things. And the RTD, uh, the biggest one is. Over temperature, so you don't want to go over that 1100 Fahrenheit limit. Uh, you can still get corrosion, vibration can be an issue. On the next slide, I'm going to talk about an option that we have to address uh, making RTDs more vibration resistant. Uh, and moisture insulation, uh, you know, insulation, rough handling can all affect it. So we have what's called a high vibe RTD. And the thermocouple itself, or the, I'm sorry, the RTD itself has got very thin platinum wires coming off it, about the size of the thickness of your a head of hair, or a hair and head. And that that junction between that and your copper wires is the, the part that can uh, break with vibration. So what we do with a high vibe is we 
we position those wires, we, um, we reinforce them, we pot them and keep them from moving so that you can still get the accuracy of an RTD in a high vibration environment. We developed this for a turbine manufacturer uh, a number of years ago, and um, they've got about you know, five times the life out of their RTDs in their, um, their turbine test cells that they, they use to test the turbines. And uh, it's got a lot of vibration and it's worked out really well for them. Okay, um, any other questions before I go to the configurator? <clears throat> uh, none right now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Uh, you know what? Actually, why don't we uh, try? We have uh, we have another poll, so uh, possible okay. redemption yep, right. situation here for uh, any of the ones that didn't get the first one correct. So um, we're gonna send the other poll out right now. You should see it. So it's gonna be which is more accurate here: um, a two-wire RTD or a three-wire RTD. So we'll give that a few seconds. All right, some good responses here. All right, so thanks everyone for participating. Looks like 96% of the voters did get the correct answer that the three wire RTD is more accurate. So perfect. Nice work again, everybody. Very nice. Okay, um, so the next thing I want to show everyone is uh, we do have online product configurators that are uh, pretty powerful tools for um, putting together part numbers and then also you'll get an engineer drawing of the product that you create. Um, it's also going to help you to not make any mistakes in terms of uh, mating up you know, thermal wall with an RTD or thermocouple. So uh, it's a pretty good tool if you want to check that out. Uh, we have diaphragm seals, pressure gauges, all, all kinds of different products. Um, but today we'll go through the thermocouple and RTD one. Um, and I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, the first selection you're going to make is if you want a head assembly by itself, you would click over here. If you want a head assembly with the thermal, the configurator is going to allow you to put those two products together and, and configure them um, at the same time and, and get a drawing of the RTD or thermocouple with a thermal. And then if you want a stem only, you would click down here. So. We'll do a thermal and uh, temperature sensor together. Okay, so first selection is gonna be the type of thermal, so threaded flanged, uh, weld in, sanitary. Uh, we'll do a threaded, and then the bore, so if you have a quarter inch diameter stem, you do your 260 bore, uh, three eighths if you need it. Lots of different material choices, so the most standard 316 or 304. Um, but we do have exotics if you, if you need that. Uh, as far as the shank style, we have step uh, <clears throat> straight or tapered. There is a helpful video if you need tips on which one to select. We'll go with the step shank. Process connection, typically that's gonna be three quarter inch MPT, but we do have other options if you need something else. Uh, this is a nice tool if you, Put in your stem lengths, your A dimension. Your A dimension is going to be your element length, so that's your stem length. If you, get a, if you know that you have a six inch uh, stem length, that's your A dimension element. You could drop in six inch, and it's automatically going to tell you what is the U dimension, the insertion of that thermal based on the six inch stem. Or if you only have a U dimension on your, um, you know, your technical sheet, you can just put in the U dimension, and then it will calculate what your A dimension is for your element length, um, vice versa. There are options for, you know, if you want to put in a stainless steel tag, you can type in tag number, uh, wake frequency, mill certs, lots of different options for the thermal. <clears throat> Log in real quick. Um, very quick to create a login and then so this is gonna be your part number your description and your list pricing this drawing is of the thermal wall itself uh, but I'm gonna keep going to the sensor 
so here you can select the type of head you want. So you know, let's say you need explosion proof. It's going to have your FM CSA approval. <clears throat> we do have some other you know, options too. Uh, additional heads are down here if you need something else. And then if you need a half inch conduit, you can select that. On the transmitter side of things, you can get your 4 to 20 or heart. So we'll do a 4 to 20. And then if you put in your calibration range for that temperature transmitter, it'll add that to the drawing. And then your spring loaded fitting with half inch MT, uh, very common. Um, you can have nipple unit nipples, <clears throat> different configurations. And then here again, your selection. So you know, based on your temperature, are you above 1100 Fahrenheit? Um, do you need higher accuracy? You're gonna make your choice of which ones you need. We'll go with an RTD. <clears throat> you see your class B 100 ohm, very common. Uh, you can get a class A 100 ohm, which is gonna give you higher accuracy. Uh, A3, high accuracy as well. A5, all you know, just kind of higher grades of, of uh, 100 ohm. Then the thousand ohm class B, class A, uh, the nickel copper that we talked about too. Those are options, but um, less common. So we'll go with a class B hundred ohm. A <clears throat> uh, class A, just by the way, will give you about double the accuracy of your RTD. So that's another thing to keep in mind for you know not that much more of a cost. You're going to get a whole lot more accuracy out of that RTD, uh, and you're already getting a, a pretty very good accuracy. Uh, the wire selection, so again, you know, three wire, four wire, you don't really want to do that two wire, but it is there if you, you know, it's already spec'd out if that's, you know, something that is required. Uh, and then the duplex, so you can put two RTDs inside of the same stem, same way that you can with a, a thermocouple, you can get a, a two sensors in there. <clears throat> Calibration certs, uh, the high vibe option that we talked about, uh, tag, if you know, if you want to add in tag number as well so now we've, we've configured everything you've got your sensor your your rtd the part number description and list pricing and a drawing you've got your thermwell part number description drawing and then this last one this is a drawing of both the sensor and the thermwell Let's see if this pops up for me so we've got our explosion proof head, that um, spring loaded half inch MPT, the thermwell, and the configurator is not gonna let you build something that won't work. So it won't let you build a, a stomach that's too long for the thermwell. That's one of the reasons that we start with the thermwell is to make sure that everything fits properly. Um, it does have the approvals on here. So this is a, a customized drawing to you know, exactly the, the components that you've put together. So you'll instantly have that drawing to reference. <clears throat> Okay. Um, so we do have 3D drawings as well. If you go to our website, under a lot of the products, you know, if you were uh, for like a, the skid manufacturers, um, you know, even process facilities, or if you're drawing everything in 3D, we do have 3D drawings for uh, step files. I just whatever uh, format you need that are kind of a basic generic head assembly or whatever product you choose, pressure gauge, that you can upload or download uh, and just use those internally. And then the last thing I wanna show you, just to wrap up here. <clears throat> so we do have a, a brand new catalog that just actually came out a couple of days ago. And a lot of the information that we talked about today is in our catalog, which is, it's available on our website. To download and catch kind of your cutaway view of your temperature sensor, um, which goes back to kind of that cold junction question too. This is a transmitter in here. You could have a terminal block, um, different connections, and then you know what is a thermocouple, thermocouple types, um, junctions, and my cables, special limits of error. All of that information that we covered today is available <clears throat> you know, in that catalog too. We also have response time, so if you quarter inch them, that's grounded. This is your, uh, your response time to 63% of the temperature. Uh, grounded, quarter inch, ungrounded, so you can see it's about twice as 
place for a fast response there um, if you have a grounded versus ungrounded. Now, uh, there's other dammers in here too, so you can compare those. Uh, but it's good. It's a good resource just in general. I'll skip over to the RTD section quickly. And so again, just you know, kind of a description your your different accuracy. This is the formula to calculate your accuracy. So if you have a you want to know is my what's my class B RTD what's the accuracy going to be at um, you know, 850 degrees. You can pop that into the formula and get your the plus or minus accuracy of that RCD, or uh, class A, class AA, 110 DIN, uh, different setup. So good options there and another accuracy comparisons and some other resources too. The high vibe option that we talked about, extended life and uh, other resources. So. With that, um, let's see if I can go back here. That's um, you know that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all very much. Appreciate it and appreciate your time. Are there any other questions that um, came up? Yes. Uh, so we got one quick question here. Um, I'll also <clears throat> turn the uh, presentation over here to Kevin, um, who I believe has some final words. But um, while that's happening, there, there was a question regarding um, the ability to um, position a a head location on a on a head connection assembly. So is there a way that you can specifically set uh, the final location uh, of a head? I'm wondering if this is maybe an appropriate well, for in a, terms of a yeah. compression fitting connection. Yeah, yeah, I would use um like a nipple union nipple, um, which is kind of very similar to compression fitting too. Where um, with a nipple union nipple, that's going to allow you to rotate that head and point it in whatever whatever direction you want. So um, if you if you go through the online product configurator, you'll see the nipple union nipple as your one of the options. And um, Actually, that yeah, will allow you to. Uh, this image that Kevin has up on the screen right now is a nipple union nipple. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Perfect. Yep. There. There you go. Yeah. So that's a that's a great example there. Where that, then you can rotate that head um, to get it, you know, facing the direction you have your incoming wires. Okay. Great. Kevin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for attending. We realized we went over our our allotted time, but. Um, uh, we realized that yesterday when we were comparing notes that we would probably be doing that and apologize for that. But based on the questions and the engagement, uh, we feel like we're on the right track here. So we do appreciate your attendance. Certainly, if you have any follow-up questions, um, you, you, our contact information's out there. We've sent you the email. Uh, we will be following up with an email after this one, and we will be um, announcing another uh, web webinar next Wednesday at the same time, um, likely. So you'll see that in your email. Again, uh, thanks for attending. And um, we will be talking to you shortly. Thank you.